If we're careful enough to consider both intended and unintended consequences, we'll find out that there is a dangerous relationship between economic decisions and human well-being. While economics is for the improvement of society, it is quite unfortunate that its policies have led to people losing their lives. This brings up the big question, why is economics failing and how is it affecting individuals? Before we go on, be sure to like this video and subscribe to this channel. There have been some huge economic failures in history, from bank failures to wars and global recessions. The world has literally imploded over and over again. One failure that particularly stands out is the oil crisis in the 1970s. Back in October 1973, the OPEC nations imposed an oil embargo against the U.S. and other Western countries. It was so terrible that in the months that followed, crude oil prices doubled, and by the end of the decade, they doubled again. Unfortunately, it wasn't just oil prices. The costs of items shot up to the sky. Inflation doubled what it was before the energy crisis, climbing as high as 13% by 1980. At the same time, unemployment grew from less than 5% at the end of 1973 to almost 11% at the end of 1982. This combination of rapid price increases and slow growth led to what we now call stagflation. You most likely won't see this in your economics textbooks, but stagflation is really a thing. It was coined from stagnation and inflation, and happens when you mix slow economic growth with steadily rising prices and high joblessness, all at the same time. It simply means costs are going up while gross domestic product, that is, the total value of goods and services produced by the country, is going down. Since GDP is considered a measure of a country's overall economic health, its decline indicates poor health. Inflation also means that businesses and consumers have decreased purchasing power. In other words, they are in poor economic health too. The high unemployment rate, on the other hand, only worsens the slowdown of the economy. Before the 1970s, stagflation seemed like an impossible problem. In fact, most economists at the time thought that inflation and unemployment rates moved in opposite directions. This was because, well, if people don't have jobs, they can't afford things, so prices go down. And the more people had jobs, the more they would spend, pushing prices up. But this was soon disproved. The stagflation of the 1970s proved that the assumption was false, so economists had to rethink the mechanics of inflation and how to boost economic growth without pushing prices too high too fast. One would think economists would have learned from the economic failures of past years enough to avoid issues in present times, but unfortunately, that is not the case. The issues facing the global economy, which include inflation, climate change, the war in Europe, supply chain disruptions, and the COVID-19 pandemic, have turned into what experts now call a polycrisis. It is true that the global economy has been under the worst pressure in previous years. How bad can the situation be today? As the World Economic Forum's Global Risks Report 2023 stated, the return to a new normal following the COVID-19 pandemic was quickly disrupted by the outbreak of war in Ukraine, ushering in a fresh series of crises in food and energy, triggering problems that decades of progress had sought to solve. Ahead of the Forum's 2023 annual meeting in Davos, Switzerland, two experts share their thoughts on the myriad of threats facing the global economy and detail historical parallels that can help policymakers grapple with the challenges of today. It is quite obvious that with Europe experiencing the most dangerous conflict since the Second World War, the pandemic refusing to die quietly, slow economic growth, and the highest inflation rates in four decades, the global economy is going to be rough in the coming years. In navigating these risks, the biggest challenge for politicians and corporate leaders will be to adjust to the end of ultra-low, post-financial crisis interest rates. Interestingly, the era where debt seemed like a free lunch and could be used to solve anything is likely over, partly because global debt has risen so much, and many countries are now needing to sharply increase investment in both defense and green energy investment. This is without ignoring the looming fractures in globalization. Looking at it critically, it all seems like the 1970s is coming back again. 
But there's good news. Central banks today understand far better how to deal with supply shocks that raise inflation. At the same time, the supply-side reforms, which helped lift advanced economies in the 1980s and developing countries in the 1990s, have become politically unacceptable in many quarters. Now, there is fear that the global economy will tip into recession with brutal financial fallout. The poly crisis today means that the challenges faced by the global economy are deeply interconnected with all global systems. The global political economy, international security, global health, education and energy, and so on. As the world recovered from the pandemic, the energy crisis from the war in Ukraine sparked new complexities in addition to inflation, climate change, and inequality. Today's polycrisis includes relationships between systems that include common drivers, domino effects, and vicious cycles interacting all at once, which continue to worsen economic vulnerabilities. And although the world has experienced interconnected crises before, including post-World War I, oil shocks in the 1970s, and the 2008 financial crisis, the situation now is unique due to the interconnectedness accelerated by the Fourth Industrial Revolution. Going forward, the world should capitalize on what has worked in the past, dialogue, multi-stakeholder collaboration, and multilateralism. But to do so, accountable and agile leadership is critical. Now that's the major problem. Is the world leadership willing to take up such responsibility? No doubt economists have learned a lot from the period after the First World War. It is now clear that turning inward during times of global challenges only exacerbates problems, leading to more violent conflict. Leaders must choose to meet unprecedented complexity with unprecedented transformation, even if it means that power dynamics or relationships change. History has also shown that digital technologies can be disruptive, but they can also be powerful tools for reducing uncertainty and visualizing complex relationships. Speaking of complex, the seemingly huge economic problems always find a way to meet you at a personal level, which is why it is your business. Economics affects our daily lives in both obvious and subtle ways, and from an individual point of view, it frames many choices we have to make about work, leisure, consumption, and how much to save. Our lives are also influenced by macroeconomic trends, such as inflation, interest rates, and economic growth. A recent development in economics is the work of behavioral economics, which places more emphasis on elements of psychology. For example, are humans really rational utility maximizers like traditional economic theory explains? Well, behavioral economics suggests not, because in reality, humans are influenced by emotional factors, such as loss aversion, where we prefer the status quo to losing what we have. You would agree that when making decisions, we don't tend to first look at leading economic indicators. But what we think about the economic outlook can influence certain decisions. For example, those aware of the current economic situation will know that low interest rates are far more likely. This suggests that if you could get a mortgage, mortgage payments would be cheaper, but saving would give a poor return. Also, the bad state of the economy and high unemployment rate is a factor that may encourage students to stay on and study. Since youth unemployment is currently very high, it makes more sense to spend three years getting a degree rather than going straight into the job market. The only problem with this is that many other students are thinking the same thing, making the competition for university places really strong. Aside from all of that, how does global economic failure affect your economic welfare? Simple, the real value of savings will continue to decline. So in periods of high inflation, it is advisable to take out savings accounts and bonds, which give an interest rate related to the inflation rate. But if you cannot secure a good interest rate, another option is to invest in commodities or assets, which can protect their value better than ordinary savings accounts. As a final thought, is economics overvalued? As a society, do we give too much weight to maximizing income, profit, and GDP? In a sense, traditional economics encourages us to view life from an economic point of view. But maybe this causes us to miss out on more important issues such as concern for the environment, concern for others, and getting the correct work-life balance, making economics deadly. With that, we've come to the end of this video. Don't forget to like and subscribe if you haven't already. See you soon.